Right, it's suddenly time for another opinion piece brought about by the reactions to my Q&A video and also some general reactions to the concept that I've seen around the web, generally speaking, anyway. Pluses and minuses to autoloaders. I'm personally quite a fan of them, and I don't think there are quite as many downsides as there are often claimed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the various positives and then I'm going to go through the arguments against. Over the years, there have been a number of different types of autoloader designs, such as the twin revolver with gravity ramp, as you'd find on an AMX-13, or I believe the Jordanian Falcon. Uh, there was a chain lift system found on an M41 once. Uh, or there's the American design, which is a sort of an extract lift feed system, such as that found on T-54E1 or today's Stryker MGS. These days, though, two designs have generally come to the fore, the cassette and the carousel. And it's also to be mentioned that the autoloading need not be entirely automated. It is possible to have a semi-autoloader by use of a mechanism to present rounds to the human loader, bringing us to the minority configurations such as that found on Merkava 4. An autoloader presents a couple of basic mechanical problems. Firstly, the round must be placed into a position so that it can be rammed into the gun tube. Secondly, the autoloader and the gun tube have to line up which used to be quite a problem. Fortunately, these days, we have generally gotten the gist of these problems sorted out. So, back to cassette and carousel. As a general rule, in production vehicles, Russian-based tanks have gone with the carousel, and Western tanks have gone with the cassette. It's not a hard and fast rule, though, but it's pretty good. Normally you'll find carousel-based autoloaders under the turret. T-80, for example, carries 28 rounds down below, the T-72, 22. The Abrams TTB carried 44 rounds in the turret in, uh, in the carousel, but because it didn't need to leave room for the crew, the, uh, the rounds were stowed vertically, thus filling up the basket. I have not been on an M8 AGS, the Buford, but I have been inside the predecessor vehicle, the CCVL, which I think has a similar autoloader layout. And that autoloader takes up the entire left side of the turret, left of the gun, while the commander and gunner are in tandem on the right side of the turret, a bit like a you know, normal M1. And that's a sort of a chain-driven thing which pulls around, uh, sort of around the carousel, sort of a loop. Uh, so I'm going to call it a carousel as well. The cassette is found on tanks like Type 90, Leclerc, S-Tank, Oplot M, or the Abrams with the Megat autoloader. Generally speaking, these go in the bustle. You normally can't fit in quite as many rounds into a cassette bustle as you can into a man manual rack because you've got to leave some room for the machinery, but the difference isn't huge. So for example, in a manually loaded M1, i.e. a normal one, the current configuration is 36 rounds in the bustle whilst the Megat autoloader system fits 34, which brings us to the first advantage of the autoloader, which is sustained rate of fire. It is said that humans can load faster than an autoloader. I'll say in response to that, firstly, that autoloaders have definitely gotten a lot faster, and it's likely that the rate of fire at this point is more going to be limited by the target engagement process, or obscuration, for example, than it is by the amount of time it takes the gun to be loaded, no matter who's, who or what is doing the loading. Secondly, a human loader is going to slow down over time. Not necessarily because he's getting tired, although he will be, but also because the rounds would no longer be in the sweet spot. And this is a group of four or six rounds in honeycomb where a loader is most comfortable reaching the ammunition and then flipping it over and throwing it in. Any loader worth his salt will be restowing rounds into the sweet spot in between gunnery engagements to make his life easier. Grabbing rounds from the various corners of the rack is a little bit more inconvenient. Finally, the human loader in an M1 reaches a hard stop at 18 rounds, because that's the end of the ready rack, assuming that all of those 18 rounds were the appropriate type of round for all of the targets. More likely, of that 18 rounds, you might have 7 Sabo, 5 Heat, 2 Can, 2 Empat, and 2 HEOR. So if you're facing off against a whole bunch of tanks, after 7 rounds, you're down to shooting less optimal rounds, like Empat or Heat. The other rounds are stowed behind the TC or in the hull, and there is going to be a serious delay in getting more Sabos up. 
The autoloader, though, will have some 13 or 4 Sabo available immediately to hand, or to machine. Now, the above fingers are a bit of a sample, as the, uh, especially with the M1, the new AMP round is supposed to generally replace most of those ammunition types, but the point of availability is still the same. An autoloader will give you more shots before you have to stop. There is a significant caveat to this, though. The comparative ammunition capacity is based on the assumption of the same volume of ammunition space. An Abrams bustle is much bigger than that of a Leclerc or a Type 90, for example, which means that the latter vehicles will hold 22 or 20 rounds apiece, providing only a marginally better ready ammunition capacity before restocking needs to happen. However, we'll come back to size in a moment. So now we move on to safety. So part one, that's pretty simple. The armor between the ammunition and the crew compartment can be better than in manual versions of the type. So if you look at an Abrams or a Leopard 2, you'll see there's a large armored door. It's a couple of feet square in size. It's really heavy. I almost felt like I lost my arm to it if you saw my other video. And it separates the crew from the ammo. If the door is closed and the ammunition cooks off, blast at the top, great, the crew is safe. The problem occurs if the door is open in the middle of the loading process when the tank gets hit, which is, let's say, loading as fast as you can, one second out of six. There is a large unarmored area when the door is open. An autoloader need only have a gap in the armor large enough for the round to fit through. So instead of a big, huge sliding door with hydraulics to move the weight of this big, huge sliding door, an autoloader hatches you know, six, eight inches in diameter and vastly reduces the vulnerability. And it is for this reason that some semi-autoloader systems have been created, such as the old fast draw system for the 90s. And uh, Merkava, of course, famous for being designed to accrue survivability, most, most important of all, also uses a revolver semi-autoloader. It is a little bit slower than normal manual loading, as the round is gently fed into the loader's hands when he pushes a button, but it does mean that there is only a small hatch open, reducing the chances of an ammunition catastrophe. Further, as there is no need to hydraulically move a big piece of metal, the armor itself can be heavier and welded into place. Underfloor turret carousels, such as on T-72, do actually have some armor between the crew compartment and the ammunition, but so far nobody seems to have gone as far as sealing it off entirely with blowout panels down below. Now that should be actually quite possible. The Abrams hull ammunition vents out under the bottom of the tank, for example. The second part of the safety comes under the category of indirect benefits. There are really only two ways to increase armor thickness on a tank. Choice one, we simply add more armor to the extant shape, which is why the M1 is now blown through 70 odd tons. Tanks these days are starting to get to the practical limit with today's infrastructure, and we also keep needing to buy stronger AVLBs. Choice two, you make the overall shape smaller with the same amount of metal used. If you have a smaller tank, you need less metal to make armor 12 inches thick, for example, than you would for a larger tank. And the single biggest user of space in a tank is the crew. Remove one of the crewmen, you now have a smaller tank, and with far more protection for the crew than the larger tank has for exactly the same weight. It is also a slightly harder target, it's a bit smaller, although that doesn't really make a whole huge amount of difference with modern fire control systems. And for the same level of protection and the same engine, you get a higher horsepower to rate ratio and lower ground pressure. So if you're the sort of person who believes that the primary weapon of a tank is its tracks, that is not a factor that you would casually overlook. So to summarize, autoloaders are either about as fast as a human loader or faster. They tend to have more ammunition ready to hand. They are safer. They permit smaller, faster, tougher tanks for the same weight. So what are the arguments against? Well, the first argument is that an autoloader is a machine and can break down. Now, personally, I think more loaders have broken down by slamming their faces into a hatch ring, uh, but the point is true. And swapping out a human loader is much easier than swapping out an autoloader. Uh, that is, if the autoloader isn't repairable by a simple part swap, and if you happen to have a spare human loader. The entire tank though, I mean, a tank is filled with systems that can break down. And if you're worried about the thing breaking down, why have a tank, I mean, really? And I see no reason to think that the autoloader is any more likely to fail than any other part of a tank. 
And certainly countries which have had multiple generations of autoloader tanks, such as Russia and Japan, have evidently not found sufficient issue with the system to stop using them. The TTB autoloader completed 66,000 cycles without failure. That's pretty good. The next argument you'll sometimes hear is that the gun needs to reset to a loading position and then be taken off target. Now this would indeed have been an issue in the earlier autoloader days, but times have changed. We now have gun control systems which can accurately lay onto a target two miles away. So does anybody really think this gun control system is going to have an issue lining up within reach of a feed tray? Uh, also, modern gun systems where the gun follows the sight are standard. And so there is no issue with the sight being taken off target during the loading process because the, the gun is being told to do something separate to what the sight is. Now, note that most human loaded tanks these days will also reset the gun to a loading position to make life easier for the loader. And the amount of time that it takes for the gun to reset from the loading position to the aiming position is a lot less than the amount of time it takes to yell up and fire. It is true that in emergency mode, when the main control system is offline, that the sight will be taken off target because now the sight follows the gun. I am unsure how human loaded loading position tanks such as Challenger 2 actually crack that issue, but I'm sure somebody will tell me. And besides, if you're arguing your entire tank on the basis of emergency mode, issue. Argument three is a little bit stronger. Removing the fourth crewman removes a fourth set of eyeballs from the tank. So ordinarily when the loader is not actually loading, he should have his head out and scanning. Of course, once the shooting starts, he's head down and he's not scanning anymore. So there is only a limit to that benefit. Argument number four. In battle troubleshooting will be better in a four man crew if there is a failure in the system and the TC and the gunner can continue to fight or observe whatever with other weapons while the loader is doing his own immediate action, such as let's say rotating the round. In an autoloader tank, the gunner or the TC must do this. The next most commonly cited reason is that uh, with the reduction in manning, there are fewer people available to do maintenance or pull sentry duty and so on. I reject this argument. If one changes a tank company from, say, 14 four-man tanks to 14 three-man tanks, that does not mandate that the number of tankers in the company be reduced from 56 to 42. It only mandates that 42 of them be in the tank during the battle. Now, though I'm actually having a little bit of difficulty verifying this, I am led to believe that the French have solved this problem by putting all the extra tankers into an APC or two. So ordinarily, this means that fewer folks are in the line of fire, Although, if necessary, the guys in the APC can do a dismounted role for maybe local security, peeking over ridges or whatever. Once the company is in larger for maintenance or overnight, whatever, the fourth men go to their tanks and then they can perform those additional manpower duties. It also means that you can lose crewmen to leave or illness or injury without reducing the combat power of the vehicle. And in Iraq, we ran three-man crews around on our M1s for a very significant amount of time because of leave and illness and so on. Now, there is an unfortunate reality which runs against this idea, and that is that the bean counters will say, hey, three-man tanks, we can reduce the manning requirements and either save money on training or put the manpower to other uses. Now, that is a doctrine slash manning slash structure issue and not anything related to the tank. The last major reason against autoloaders is familiar to militaries throughout our history, and it's called institutional inertia. Although militaries are usually quite happy to adopt new technology and ideas, they are extremely reluctant to move away from what has been working in the past. Or as so you might also put it, if it ain't broke, why fix it? And oftentimes a change has to be forced upon them uh, despite opposition. Now, although more and more countries are moving towards autoloaders, it is not universal. So Korea and uh, France, for example, have moved to autoloaders from manual loaders uh, with their newly developed APC, uh, MBTs, I'm sorry. But uh, India and Turkey did not. Now, India seems to be kind of split on the idea in fairness because they do actually have plenty of autoloader tanks, but Arjun is not one of them. The only country I can think of to have actually dropped the autoloader uh, was uh, Sweden, but the S-Tank was kind of a unique case. 
Thus, so far, it seems to be more a matter of preference uh, in which various positives and negatives are weighed and depending on what your country chooses to be more important. As mentioned in the Q&A video, although it is possible to retrofit an autoloader to an Abrams or a Leopard, and prototypes have indeed been made, it is not worth it in my opinion. You don't get all those advantages I listed above, although there may be something to be said for at least installing the semi-autoloader magazine system similar to Merkaba. Otherwise, to take full advantage of the system, an entirely new turret would be required to be made for the vehicles. And this is a very large expense for a tank which is already in production and performing reasonably well with you know, only upgrades. So there you go, the positives and negatives. I personally believe that autoloaders are the correct route and that the worldwide trend seems to agree with me, but it isn't as if there are no arguments against. Now, if I've missed any arguments on the pro or the con side, throw them down below in the comments and I will address them in a future video. On other news, when I announced the Significant Emotional Event t-shirts, it turned out a bunch of you commented that you would like to have a Tank is on Fire t-shirt. You missed it. So what I've done is I've uh, told Everpress to link up orders for all the three types of t-shirts uh, for a little while and that way you can order them and catch up. Uh, if you are in Canada, have a look at the Ontario Regiment Museum. They might be selling a few and that way they get a cut of the profits and it helps them out. Uh, so right, that's it. Autoloaders. Take care and we'll see what the next video takes us.